This video was prepared to start a discussion on the design of the experiments needed to do effective and efficient research in the support of smallholder farmers in tropical farming systems. It was prompted by work with the Collaborative Crop Research Programme, CCRP. In 1925, Fisher, who was chief statistician at Rothamsted Experimental Station, published this book on research methods. It described the basic concepts and principles of experimental design as used in agricultural research. Research in agriculture has changed a lot in the 90 years since then, and experiments are not the only tools used, but they are still vitally important, and the same key principles are still at the core of every good experimental design. Many experiments look something like the upper one here, photographed from the air. It consists of a number of small plots in a field in which different practices are compared. Exactly the same concepts apply if the experiment is in a lab or a nursery. These days, agricultural research often involves working closely with farmers and their organisations, and it may require studying whole farms or landscapes, not just small plots. Experimentation is still often feasible and important, and effective experiments are built on the same experimental concepts and principles. So what are these key principles? I will try to illustrate them with a very simple example. This is not a real example, but it is realistic. I have a problem of stem borer destroying maize in fields. A breeder tells me he has a new variety, bore proof, which is less susceptible than the one currently being grown, called M512. I want to do an experiment to check if it works. That is, I want to test the prediction or hypothesis that when I grow bore proof, it will be less damaged by stem borer than M512. So that is my objective the objective of the experiment, and there you have the first key concept. All aspects of the design are driven by the objectives. Here is my first attempt at a design. I plant a field of bore proof and measure the percent damage. That brings in the second principle of measurement. But once I have measured percent damage here, what can I do with it? I need something to compare it with. So for my second design, I have a field of bore proof and another of M512. I can then make a comparison. That's my next concept. The conditions I can bear, the treatments, and the things I can bear them on are the experimental units. In this case, whole fields. Choosing treatments and suitable experimental units are important principle-based parts of designing the experiment. I measured percent damage in both fields and found 20% for bore proof and 50% for M512. So the bore proof has lower damage. But this is hardly convincing evidence in support of my hypothesis. Maize growers know that the level of damage can vary a lot from field to field, and this difference between 20 and 50% could just be chance and due to the two particular fields that are selected. So here is my third attempt. Rather than having just one field of each treatment, I now have four of each, eight fields in total. I have introduced some replication. When I measure percent damage on each field, I found that in general there is less in the fields of bore proof. The mean for bore proof is certainly smaller than the mean damage for M512. But there is a lot of variation between fields of the same variety, so the result is not very convincing. It's not a very precise experiment. Precision is the next concept to pay attention to and leads to my fourth design. Rather than taking a whole field as my experimental unit, I mark out two 10 by 10 meter plots in each field. On the left hand plot, I grow bore proof, and on the right hand plot, M512. Now, when I compare the two, I am comparing them in the same fields. The field-to-field -field variation does not mess up the comparison, and I can get a more precise result. I've used the principle of blocking, with the fields 
being white blocks. Looking at the results, I can see that boreproof had lower damage than M512 on every field except number 7, and that had no stem borer anyway. That must be convincing evidence in support of my hypothesis. But there is a flaw. Bore proof is on the left hand plot in every field. Maybe these plots would always have less damage. Perhaps, for example, the wind tends to blow from the right and bring pests to the M512 plots first. That might be far fetched, but with this design, you cannot be sure that there is no systematic difference between the two plots in each field other than that due to variety. The solution is to randomize, decide at random which plot of each pair gets the bore proof and which gets M512. With a design like this, we can reach a clear conclusion. Of course, you may want to check that this conclusion applies in other conditions, such as other seasons or locations. So there we have the nine most important concepts to understand for the design of effective and valid experiments. There are a few more that could be added, and there have been some developments since Fisher's time. When researchers work closely with farmers, when they want to look at how effects vary in space or over time, then there are a few more concepts that are important. However, the nine here are the most fundamental. Understanding them is not too hard, but putting them into practice in real experiments can be tricky or expensive. We will look at that, those applications and practical details in later sessions. Thank you, Rick, for that clear overview of the principles of experimental design. Now I'd like to present our first MX discussion point. The basic framework of experimental design principles can be built on by many other key principles that relate particularly to an area of work, such as breeding, soil management, agronomy, etc. Please head over to the forum and share those that you've come across in your line of work. The example in this video was taken from a freely available online book called GEAR which stands for Graduate Environmental and Agricultural Research. For further details, go and read the rest of GEAR's chapter 3.5 on experimental design. The text continues to describe some of the practical implications and problems associated with each of the principles presented in this video. Our second discussion point is about the gear chapter. It described many of the mistakes that people make in experimental design. We would like for you to do the opposite. Come to the forum and share any tips, tricks or good practice that you've picked up from experience, colleagues, teachers or even the research method support team.